Hello and welcome to Everyday Eternal. I'm Sam Craven. Unfortunately, I will not be joining you today. I'll be passing those duties over to Matt. Today, we're going to talk about how very, very wrong we were. We have a very special guest to help us explore that a little bit. And with that, I'll pass it over to Matt to introduce our guest. Welcome back, Mr. Bob Huang. Yeah, thank you for having me. So, as you guys may have heard, Bob has been on the show once before. Uh, do you remember how long ago that was, Bob? Uh, I believe that was not too long after GPDC, so it might have been like, you know, in December or so. Oh, geez, that was like 10 months ago. Yeah, well, a while. Okay, well, like I said, welcome back. So, recently you uh, did take down Star City. Do you want to tell us a little bit about it and where it was? And... Uh, sure, so got up to drive, got up early to drive up to Dirty Jersey. Uh, it was worth the trip. I was trying to get carpool with some friends, but everybody ended up kind of bailing on me. But overall, once I got there and got going, it was worth it. So what did you end up playing? So I played Blue Red Delver, uh, made some changes. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people have seen the list by now, but basically my creature suite had uh, four Delver, four Young Pyromancer, and also four Monastery Swiss Spears, which I affectionately call Taylor Swiss Spear. That, okay, that's, yeah, that's allowable. That's good. I like that. That's pretty impressive. Did you come with that, up with that on your own, or is that something that you'd heard before? No, so funnily enough, um, I was testing on Cockatrice, and I was playing, like, Bug Delver or Blue White Red Delver, uh, and then I came up against this random person, uh, and then we were playing, and he was playing this list, basically, uh, with, with a few changes that I've made. But basically, he had the same creature package, and he was playing lots of burn spells, uh, and I was like, wow, this deck is coming out of the gates really, really fast. And so he whooped me... At first, I was like very skeptical. I was like, okay, this Monastery Sister is not a good card. Like, why are you playing it? But no, it did a ton of damage very quickly. So I was very impressed with his list. And then I, uh, I asked him to see it. And then I told him um, my Facebook username. And he's like, oh, I actually tried to friend you uh, like many months ago after GPDC to talk about Team America. And you ignored my friend request. And I was like, oh, sorry. I had no idea who you are. Sounds kind of familiar now. Uh, and I went back, accepted the friend request. And then uh, we worked a little bit more on the deck. And it was great. Yeah, so I mean, I'm, I look, I'll be honest, on the previous podcast we had talked about Treasure Cruise, and I was skeptical. Now, at the time I'd actually not read um, Carson Carter's article about it, mm-hmm. <clears throat> so I know a lot of people were kind of agreeing with him, and in my assumption and my analysis of the card, the way I was thinking about it was more along the lines of what does Treasure Cruise replace in these decks? And my line of thinking was, why would you ever want to replace Ponder or Brainstorm? So therefore, there is no room in the deck for this card. Mm-hmm. That was my initial thought process about it. But how did it end up fitting into the deck? What did you end up cutting to just jam in Treasure Cruise, in, especially, like, say, Blue Red Delver? Yeah, um, so Blue Red Delver, I think the list changed significantly just because the creature base was very different. Um, like, old lists were either running, like, Goblin Guides or Grim Lava Mancers. So Grim Lava Mancers had to go to the board. But I think in general, um, the Delver decks, they ended up just trimming, like, the more uh, reactive cards and the more conditional cards, such as, like, Spell Pierce and Stifle. So those are the cards I I was cutting in Blue, White, Red, Delver, for example. And I just think uh, Treasure Cruise is just so powerful. And the one thing you don't see when you look at the card is that it actually helps to fuel itself. So the second cruise is actually not hard to go off after the first one. You get one card in your graveyard already, Treasure Cruise itself, and then you also, you know, draw probably some more cantrips or removal spells, and then you can sort of just chain them and have, like, a Shardless Bug type effect where you just overwhelm your opponents with cards, which is one thing, one angle that the Delver decks could never really attack from before, and it's it's incredibly strong. I agree. I mean, I was watching you play a little bit, and we've been testing at the store a lot more now, now that we kind of realized that it was a real card to include. One thing I don't like it in is actually Rug Delver. So, I mean, obviously you can imagine why. Yeah, the goose is no longer loose when he's on a boat, I guess. Yeah, it's not as good. However, the Hooting Mandrels, I don't know, that guy's pretty darn good. Yeah, Hooting Mandrels is also a very powerful card. But honestly, I think just like the fact that Treasure Cruise was printed kind of obliviates all these other cards that would have probably seen some play, like Mandrels and Murderous Cut. Just because Ancestral Recall is so absurdly powerful. Um, So I think these Delver decks all kind of have to evolve and adapt and then start playing Treasure Cruise. It's just, it's just that good. Um, as far as Rug Delver goes, um, Dan Zignorini actually built a Rug Delver deck. He, what he ended up doing is he cut Mongoose and he added Rung Pyromancers. And so he's playing like more or less the same powerful Rug cards and then the strong like Rug sideboard. So yeah, I think Rug Delver can still 
kind of you know evolve and somewhat keep up with the metagame. The only thing I'm kind of worried about, especially you say your blue red Delver deck, is what are you are you worried about? Say zealous persecution or anything at all? Um, the minus one effects are good against Young Pyromancer, but they're not necessarily very good against Swiss Spear or Del like Delver can get flipped, so they really need to time it well. Um, and you know the blue red Delver deck I played had like 31 instants in sorcery, so it was quite likely to flip. Um, so really, it's those those type of effects are only devastating against Pyromancer, and then probably you're still only trading one for one. So yeah. Okay. So what made you realize like when what was the turning point? What game did you actually play where you went Treasure Cruise is the Nutters and I was wrong? Uh, well, I was wrong too when I first looked at the spoiler. I was like, okay, this card costs eight mana. Maybe you cast it once. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. Maybe probably the other card seem the other Delve card seems stronger. Uh, but no, I was wrong as well. Uh, I think, so when did I realize Treasure Cruise was insanely good? Uh, pretty much after I read Carson's article, I was like, okay, this is Carson Cotter. Like, he knows what he's talking about. I will jam four in my Bug Delver deck and see how it plays out. Uh, and it ended up being amazing. Um, and people have been talking a lot on the source about, like, the, the synergies between, you know, using your graveyard already through cards like Deathrite Shaman and Tarmogoyf and Treasure Cruise. And I have rarely found that to be a problem. Uh, I would definitely play for uh, Treasure Cruise in every single Delver deck. What ends up happening in lots of matchups is you just use your Death Rite off of your opponent's cards, anyways. So that doesn't that's not really affected. And then as far as Tarmogoyf goes, like you, you selectively delve, basically. Yeah, you selectively delve. You might have more than seven cards. You put a Treasure Cruise in there, so you're guaranteed a sorcery. And your opponent probably has like two cards as well, so Tarmogoyf might be like a three four for one turn, which is completely acceptable. You untap, play some more spells. He gets back up there. That's the only thing I think a lot of people are scared of, is especially with like these Death Rite Shaman Tarmogoyf shells, is like where does Treasure Cruise fit in? And I agree. I think I think I think you can still be okay with it. Yeah, the one the one area I am more concerned about is if you're playing, you know, four Death Rite, four Goyf, four Cruise. I think pre board is probably fine, but then post board cards like Rest in Peace end up being really devastating if you can't like fire off your Treasure Cruises and they're just stranded in your hand. Uh, it could be very bad for you. Yeah, and there's decks that just have Hooting Mandrills and Treasure Crews, so it's just getting even worse under recipes. Yeah, so certainly. Uh, so, how would you say, what would be your advice to combating Treasure Crews? Or given your performance, what should people have done that they maybe didn't do in the tournament? Well, so, uh, this is just my theory for how the metagame is going to evolve, but I think Crews is going to start seeing a lot more play uh, in various shells. I think all the Delver decks get a lot better against the other fair decks, and they were fine. The Delver decks were fine against combo before. I think the matchup against combo weakens a little bit, um, but again, the sideboard games. I think Delver can usually get there. Um, and as far as which Delver decks are good, I I actually don't really like my blue red Delver deck going forward. If you're playing against a lot of other Delver decks who also have Treasure Cruise, then it becomes a lot harder because they're be, they're able to match your creatures with removal and your creatures are a lot weaker when they're played in the later, later turns of the game. It didn't end up working great for me because not very many people were on Treasure Cruise, so then my cruises just drew like burn and then finished them out, uh, which might not be the case when more people are on it. Fair enough. I mean, going forward, I mean, I see I see red splashes in Delver decks being really good, obviously for Red Elemental Blast. Mm -hmm. But black splashes as well, like Grixis Delver, I feel like could be a real deck. Uh, I feel like perhaps Esper Delver, because Notion Thief. Yeah, Notion Thief becomes a hell of a card now. <laughs> I mean, you got to apply the lotion, right? It's, um, I think it's a really good card. Rest in peace. The only thing is, especially for, like, say, Delver Mirrors, like, would you... I don't think I'd actually ever want to bring in Rest in Peace for my opponent's Treasure Cruises and take out my Treasure Cruises, so... Yeah, it's, it's an interesting gambit. I haven't really tested it yet. Um, I think it does merit some testing, though. Uh, actually, my personal pick for the best Delver deck going forward is Blue White Red. Just because the spells are so efficient, you're able to fill up your graveyard, and you're not really vulnerable to the graveyard otherwise. Um, furthermore, I think Stoneforge Mystic is insane with Treasure Cruise, because it lets you hit the 5 mana uh, mark for Batter Skull to play and recast it, uh, which is fantastic. Um, so I think Blue Eye Red is, might be the strongest Delver deck going forward. I'll have to test more to see, and I'm not sure if I would, you know, want to sideboard like 3 Rest in Pieces, and then I can just side out my Treasure Cruises against like Bug Delver, and they would be devastated. I'm not really sure. I haven't I haven't tested that, but it's worth exploring. Do you think Bug Delver is just not good enough because of its susceptibility to rest in peace? 
Um, so there are two issues I had with Bug Delver. Uh, one was I was a little bit scared of the hate cards people could play, uh, which ended up not being much of an issue as people, you know, didn't jump on the Treasure Cruise train. Uh, but then the other issue I saw was that there was really no way of going over the top with Bug Delver. Like, when you drew lots of cards and had, like, five mana, the things you would be doing is you'd be casting, like, a, an Abrupt Decay or Tarmogoyf. There was just no real way of, like, going over the top with, like, Batter Skull or just, like, you know, an equipped batter skull is very, very, very hard to beat. Whereas, you know, if you have a bunch of Tarmogoyfs, you can still interact with that a lot more easily. Yeah, I get what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, on the other hand, like, Bug has other tools. Um, has, like, Thought Seize to ensure that you, you are the first person to get your crews off. Like, in general, one-for-ones are really good with Treasure Crews. Um, and Bug has, I think, I mean, I guess Swords of Flashers, Lightning Bolt are great one-for-ones as well, which is why I like Blue, Red, Red, but Bug has, you know, Abrupt Decay, uh, Disfigure, Thought Seize, which are also excellent. So what about the non-Delver decks? Like, where do you see Treasure Cruise fitting into, like, do you say it fits into Miracles or a combo deck? Like, what about those? Yeah, so I think the combo decks and the, uh, draw-go control decks would prefer to have Dig Through Time, just because those decks in general... They might have more mana available at the end of their opponent's turns. And so I've been testing Dig Through Time in uh, Omnitel and Sneak and Show, and it's very, very powerful there. In Omnitel in particular, um, what, what happened one game I was playing is uh, I had seven cards in my hand, um, and then I, I was trying to combo off, but my opponent had fired off some treasure cruises, so I knew they had at least like one Force of Will and probably two by now. So what I ended up doing is I had, I had a full group of seven, uh, at the end of his turn, I cast a Dig Through Time, which he let resolve, and I ended up finding, like, another Force plus Blue card, and then untapped, drew a card for turn, so I now had ten cards in my hand, and I had, like, well. three, three hard counter effects and the combo, so it was just, like, completely overwhelming. Um, so I think Dig Through Time is very strong in, uh, in decks like Miracles and Omnitel. I agree. I mean, I really liked um, Dig Through Time. A friend of mine was playing Om- Mono Blue Omnitel, and it seemed really, really powerful. Definitely. And I think the other thing with that deck is it was always super clunky. Like, Enter the Infinite is a terrible magic card. It literally does nothing unless you already have Omniscience out. And I think Dig Through Time is just is much better. You can cast it to set up the combo. You can cast it to recoup after discard. Um, and then, you know, you can cast it to find Force Blue card. And then once you have Omniscience in play, you can dig into, like, more digs. And the, the odds of you missing an Emrakul uh, or, you know, some other combo piece, Cunning Wish, perhaps... Uh, is very low if you have that density of cantrips in your deck. I mean, I've always found that that deck was always like a couple of cards away when it lost. Like, you were always like, I'm just digging for that last piece. Mm-hmm. And Dig Through Time really solves that, because you would just fire off cantrip, 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 build land, build land, show and tell. And that was your and that was your play. But being able to just like, oh, I need these particular cards, pick two, seems good. Yeah, agreed. Uh, let's see. What about, like, say, Esper Blade? Yeah, I think the um, Esper Blade and Death Blade shells uh, are also very, very powerful. Um, I think the issue with those two decks in particular is, is Mir- I think Miracles stays a deck. It's going to be very interesting to see how the meta develops, because I think actually Bug Delver is quite favored against Miracles now, just because previously um, the Haymakers from Miracles, like Terminus and Jace, were very difficult to beat. But now when you have Treasure Cruise, you can just refuel and regas. Um and you have Abrupt Decay, which is which is the main problem for Miracles, is they don't have that soft lock. I think Miracles still does fine against decks like Blue Red Delver and uh, Blue White Red, just because of the counterbalance lock. Uh, you don't care if they draw a million cards, but against like Bug, it actually does matter a lot. So give so it's kind of interesting because I feel like Bug is slightly behind against the other Delver decks, but it's ahead against Miracles, which it does fine against the other Delver decks. So it's going to be interesting to see how everything evolves. Um, but yeah, back to your original question about Deathblade and Esper Blade. I, I'm still not sure how they solve the Miracles problem. I suppose Deathblade could sideboard Abrupt Decays uh, for their already atrocious mana base. I don't know. Um, but I think those decks are also very good. And I think maybe they don't have quite the velocity of Delver decks to run four crews. But even like two or three crews, I think is easily supported and insanely powerful because they don't draw dead cards like Days. Well, that's what I was actually thinking. Because, I mean, running two treasure crews and say Esper Blade seems fine. Now, I'd never tell anyone to play Deathblade because I think that deck is terrible. The mana base is just garbage. <clears throat> Excuse me, but I think being able to run two to three treasure crews just to fuel up in the mid-game seems very powerful. Uh, you also get to run Notion Thief, Meddling Mage, 
Um, I mean, all the good cards, Zealous Persecution, like, you have, like, that particular color suite of, you know, black, white, blue has a lot of answers to all the other decks that are kind of coming up. I mean, I agree that your Miracles matchup is probably not super ideal, but I think that can be dealt with, with you know, through a combination of, like, Vendillion, Cleek, Counterspells, Meddling Mage, etc. Yeah, I mean, and they've also printed lots of catch-all answers recently. Like, I've seen people, I think Shaheen was playing Engineered Explosives and Council's Judgment, so those are kind of difficult for Counterbalance to counter. So, I mean, there are definitely ways to attack that matchup, and I think it's possible for it to be, like, passable. You could even just play Spell Snare. I mean, if you're playing a, a little bit more of a controlling build, a less creature-oriented build, like maybe with just with, like, Stoneforge Mystics, Cleek, and um, True Nemesis, mm -hmm. and then just run, like, double Spell Snare and, like, two counter spells, and, you know, it might, uh, might be fine. But we've been talking about all these blue decks and how Treasure Cruise is awesome for all these blue decks. So where does this leave all the non-blue decks? Now, I'll go first this time because I want to talk a little bit more. Do it. <clears throat> so I think this leaves most non-blue decks a little bit behind, So which is kind of sad. Uh, I think the red decks, like the non-blue red decks, so I guess that would be the Dega Shard, uh, so black, white, red. I guess Mardu or whatever it's called now. We'll talk about the new naming scheme later. Mm -hmm. uh, the Mardu Shard, Jund, Junk, and that's basically it. I think Jund is still okay. I think Jund still has a lot of play, uh, even though it is behind in its card advantage, and I'll try to explain why. You have Red Elemental Blast, which is still going to be a great card going forward. I think the value of, not actual cost, but the playability of Red Elemental Blast increases immensely going forward with Treasure Cruise. I think Chains of Mephistopheles will also be more warranted on the metagame, depending. Mm -hmm. I think I think a lot of people in their gen builds were like, do I need Chains of Mephistopheles? This card is $300. Should I buy it? I don't think it was necessary before now, except maybe when if you knew you were going to play against a lot of Omnitel. I think now we can reasonably say that you need to be packing something else if you don't have Chains of Mephistopheles. Like, you, I guess, pack more Red Blasts or, I don't know. But I think Chains of Mephistopheles does a really good job at hosing a lot of these Delver decks, because they, they reasonably have no way to remove it. I mean... Unless they're bug. <clears throat> sorry, that's what I meant. Like, non-abrupt decay Delver decks. Sure. I can agree with that. Actually, um, I, I've always not been a big fan of Jund. It's, it's one of those decks where you draw, like, the wrong sequence of cards, and you can lose, and if you draw the right sequence, you can crush them. But I, I, I do actually agree with you on this point. I actually think Jund is not terrible... Uh, in the Treasure Cruise world because because of a few things. Um, I was testing Blue White Red against Jund and I actually lost quite a few games um, in the matchup because what's happening is these Delver decks are tending to go a little bit longer when they're, you know, Ancestral Recalling. And Jund is actually pretty happy with that. They still have some, like, late game trumps such as Punishing Fire. Uh, and they also have more time to draw their answers to line, the, line them up well against, like, the threats of the Delver decks. So when you go long against Jund, even when you have Ancestral Recall, I think, you know, that one card does give you more of an edge. But on the other hand, like, they're, you have one card that's a 3-for-1, and they have a bunch of cards that are 2-for-1s. So they actually keep up not terribly. And they also have cards like, like you said, Red Blast, Thought Seize, to take your treasure cards. I mean, Fire, I mean... Yeah. I mean, the thing is, like, you, the, the decks like this have inevitability. And it, like, it doesn't matter how much car, raw card advantage, there are only so many Force of Wills in the deck. So, right. I mean, I think... I think the threats, especially for a lot, from a lot of these Delver decks, are still removed easily. And if the th and if the the card that is the answer to these, you know, say Delver or Stoneforge Mystic or whatever, are uncounterable spells or nigh uncounterable spells, like say Punishing Fire, mm -hmm. then you're still in a world of trouble, right? Yeah, and you're not playing uh, like Rest in Peace anymore because you have Treasure Cruise. Yeah, or I, I guess, or you could say, depending on how the strategy goes, maybe you do. But then if you're not cruising, are you keeping up with Jund anyway? And it's like, well. Maybe not. Agreed. So that's Jund. I think we can say that, like, I feel like Jund is going to be a fine choice going forward. Maybe not the best choice. Maybe a Treasure Cruise deck is going to be the best choice. But I think it's still fine. I would say the same thing about Dega. Dega doesn't have Punishing Fire. Now, I've been on the Dega bandwagon. I've been I've been really pushing this shard for, I would say, the last two months. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you read the post on the thread or not. Uh, a lot of people really don't delve too much into the shard, pun intended. Um, yeah, I know, terrible, right? Okay, um, let's move on. <laughs> but I, I think it has some merit. reason why, you have all the cheap removal, 
you have all the cheap removal that you could ever want. Um, you have Lightning Bolt, you have Grim Lobomancer. Like, here, let me pull up my actual data. Yeah, no, I, I'm familiar. Uh, oh, I, I played Infect that. against Dega, and it was it was a terrible matchup just because they, they had mono removal spells and discard. I was like, okay, cool. And I mean, you can just out-attrition them with, um, you know, with Lingering Souls, and you get Thoughtsies, and you can still play Chains of Mephistopheles and all of these other cool cards. So I think... I think Dega is just fine going forward. Uh, one thing I actually want to talk about kind of after this is him to Torok and what happens to this card. I think a lot of the black mid-range decks are kind of, have really been pushing him to Torok for a long time because it gives you that two for one, but I'm mm -hmm. not sure how good it is coming up with Treasure Cruise. I honestly think it's bad now, which makes me very sad because I've won many a game from chaining hymns. Uh, it's, it's very difficult to beat. But now that, you know, now if I double him them and if they just top deck a treasure cruise later, it almost completely nullifies, you know, what I just did. Um, so I really, I really don't like him. It's two mana, it doesn't affect the board, and that's another thing that's going to be important. Uh, and also the fact that it costs two mana just means that instead of playing two one mana spells to fill up your graveyard for treasure cruise, you only filled up your graveyard with one spell. So in general, I think Thoughtseize is going to be the go to discard spell in the future. I agree. Him to Turok seems like it's going to see a lot less play. Like, fueling your opponent's treasure cruises and not doing anything seems pretty bad. Unless you're hitting, unless you manage to hit all of their lands or, like, their treasure cruise and something else. I mean, yeah, I, I mean, the thing, like the thing is, like, him was so good because he could hit lands and mana screw your opponents, and when they were off tempo, you just killed them with uh, Tarmogoyfs. But now, I think, uh, like, treasure cruise will help you enable, draw those extra lands. So, that part of him is just is just no longer a thing, I think. Obviously, you, you know, you'll still get those games where you hit like I guess both the lands and the crews, as you said, and then you could potentially just have a free roll, but I think it's just it's just a lot, a lot worse than just attacking their treasure cruises with Thoughtseize. And also, it, it depends how the meta decides to shift with the inclusion of treasure cruises. Like, we saw when Mental Misstep came into the format, the format actually slowed down, because, you know, turn one was really a liability, and, you know, kind of everything got set back a turn. The question is, what happens to the actual metagame now? Because what you see is that people are actually playing a lot more one mana spells, not only to fuel treasure cruises, but to attack treasure cruise. So the game wants to go long to actually cast that treasure cruise, but the actual level of interaction is moving towards turn one, turn two, more so than it was before. Yeah, it's it's going to be interesting. I, I'm not sure if it's moving more towards turn one, turn two, but one thing I do believe is that when as treasure cruise is adopted a little bit more, I think decks like Storm, Sneak and Show, and Omni Tell. Uh, definitely benefit from that because of the pre-board games. Treasure Cruise is just—it's just not a, an inter interaction spell in the early turns of the game. So it's going to be a delicate balance of uh, like how many Treasure Cruises you run once, like you know, more of the meta starts playing these combo decks where Treasure Cruise is just not that good. No, I totally agree. I mean, it, I think it'll be really interesting to see how it shakes up. I mean, we're basically a week in, and uh, I have seen few results. I knew Avina Gaden was this weekend, but the coverage is a in Italian and b not up while the tournament is on. I don't know what that's all about. Oh, okay, cool. I mean, I'm sure it'll come out in a little bit. Um, yeah, I, 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 I've been planning on doing a meta game article right before the GP, so hopefully that'll be helpful. I'm sure it'll be very helpful to most people. So, the next question is, what were my skepticisms of Treasure Cruise and Dig Through Time, and how were they addressed by you? We already went through that, never mind. Um... Any other closing thoughts on Treasure Cruise, kind of before we move on? I have one last thing to add after whatever you're going to say, so don't worry. Okay, um, well, let's see. We, we talked a little bit about attacking Treasure Cruise, but maybe we should go into it a little further. So I don't think it's the next Mental Misstep. I think Mental Misstep, the setup cost for Mental Misstep was two life, and in Legacy, that is just not a very relevant resource most of the time. Whereas for Treasure Cruise, you actually... There's a few things. You need to play a lot of cantrips, and you also need to accept the fact that it doesn't interact with combo uh, in the earlier turns of the game. So so the downside for the first one, playing lots of cantrips, it's, it's, it's a minor downside, but essentially the cards that are good against cantrips, you know, like Spirit of the Labyrinth, Thalia, um, those kinds of effects, those become a lot more must-kill uh, as your cards are just blanked. And then the other, the other half of that is your deck becomes a lot more air. Like, you might be just cantripping into more cantrips, uh, which doesn't really do that much. So you really need to find a delicate balance between interactive spells uh, and those cantrips. So, so there are times when you just cruise, and then it's like you just draw more air, and it takes you another full turn before you actually interact with the board. 
So that is another potential downside as well. So so I guess we, we talked about you know using combo to attack treasure crews. And I guess the other thing maybe we should touch more on is is the other interactive cards like Thali and Spirit. I guess you mentioned chains. Uh, can you think of any others that might be pretty good? Yeah, um, I actually think scavengers. Agreed. So yeah, that's the other the the, uh, the other resource that treasure crews costs is uh the, is the graveyard. So if you have some good main deck, uh, main deckable gra- uh, graveyard hate, I think those cards do do get a lot better. Yeah. So do you just want to like 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 let's make a list of cards like so we said chains. Thalia is going to be pretty good for the actual setup. Scavenger use for removing the graveyard. Red Elemental Blast. Notion Thief. Yep. Obviously. Um, being able to, I mean, it's also going to be in response, and if they're, you're firing off a cruise, say, you know, for three a three mana cruise, you know, unless you have days back up as well, that Notion Thief could be hitting pretty hard. Yeah, funny you should mention that. Against Eric Smith, that's exactly what happened. I, I cast Treasure Cruise, and then he cast Notion Thief in response, and if I did not have that days or a bolt in my hand, I definitely would have lost that game, but I did, so draw three and I, th- I think, like, I've been playing Treasure Cruise main deck and Vintage, sorry, not Treasure Cruise, uh, Notion Thief main deck and Vintage is the one of, uh-huh. and obviously in Vintage he's insane, because, you know, against Oath or whatever, he's excellent. Yeah. But I think a lot of the Esper decks could maybe try a one of main deck, if you plan to run into a lot of Delver or another or other Jace decks, try it as a one of in the main. I think it's not bad. A three-one flash is also pretty good, anyway. Yeah, four I mana agree. is not great, but yeah, Greg um, Mitchell uh, very Mitchell played like Team America to an open trophy, and he had, his deck was full of one ofs. And his his reasoning was, hey, my deck has all these cantrips, and I have brainstorm. So if I draw the one of I don't want, I can just shuffle it away. And I actually really do like that line of reasoning. I, and I've been trying it a little bit more uh, with some of my decks. So yeah, I, I like Ocean Thief. I think it's a fine edge. I think your one ofs have to overlap in at least some fashion. Otherwise, you're gonna get a lot of I just didn't draw the right one of. But mm-hmm. no matter. Uh, Rust in Peace uh, is another card that I think is really going to jump up and play. I think a lot of maybe Death and Taxes lists who are like, eh, maybe I'll just like cut the Rust in Pieces are definitely going to be bringing them back. Agreed. But I don't know if they would, you know, side it in in a matchup like Blue White Red or Blue White Delver where it doesn't do anything otherwise. I think Rust in Pieces is, is an interesting card because it also enables like Helm Combo, for example, and Helm Energy Field. Uh, yeah, so that's... it'll be interesting to see if that sees a little bit more play. That's actually what I was going to talk about with Rest in Peace, so you, you basically read my mind. <laughs> you could tax and probe me. And, uh, no, yeah, I think yeah. I think the Rest in Peace energy field combo is going to be very good moving forward. Why? They're enchantments, so again, the non-Abrupt Decay Delver decks are going to have a hard time removing it, mm-hmm. and Rest in Peace is just good anyway. Yeah, definitely true. Uh, as well, I think Tezzerator could be interesting. Again, mm-hmm. it's a blue-black deck, uh, so you can run Notion Thief. You can run Leeline of the Void main deck with Helm of Obedience, and you run Chalice at one. I now, do like what, Chalice a lot, especially if everybody's filling their deck with like probes, rainstorms, and ponders, and lightning yeah, bolts. It seems really good. Now, obviously the deck is a little bit clunky to anyone who's actually played Blue Black or Blue Black Red Tezzerator. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it it can be a pile sometimes. It's like any kind of mud deck, but if it does kind of sequence the way it should, it's very powerful. And Thopter Combo just basically can't be beaten. Um, I mean, if Scavenging Ooze sees play, that actually interrupts the combo, but Deathrite Shaman actually doesn't break up Thopters, so that yeah. could be that could be something to deal with. Yeah, I think the Thopter combo is actually pretty underplayed. I wonder if there might be some shell that includes both either Dig or Treasure Cruise plus the Thopter combo, um, just because I think those cards are all just powerful together. Like, I guess if you have Cruise, you can just hit more mana, hit your combo. If you have Dig, you can probably find your combo. Um, yeah, I think it's a, it's a good win condition for sure. So I was actually going to uh, suggest a deck list for people going forward. So I, this is kind of a joke, but kind of not. Because legacy names are bad, and we're actually going to talk about that as our next uh, subject, mm-hmm. uh, I was thinking of a deck including both the Lotion Thief and the Pleasure Cruise. So I, I've been <laughs> on the strict... Yes. The, the Lotion Cruise? Okay. No, I was thinking about calling it the Love Boat. The Love Boat. I like it. And uh, just playing, like, main deck Red Elemental Blast, your own Treasure Cruises, Notion Thief, and then just basically stuff to fill that out. It's a terrible idea. It's a really terrible idea. But I just want to play it once and really gank somebody who's playing Treasure Cruise. And it would be bad against literally everything else. Yeah, it's it's possible. I I mean, Notion Thief is just, like, so incredibly powerful against Treasure Cruise, though. It's just, if you've ever Notion Thiefed in Ancestral Visions... Oh, yes, I have. Yeah. (laughs) It was glorious. 
Actually, I did Notion Thief a Jace Brainstorm as well, and that felt even. Yeah, that might even be better. <laughs> Somehow. Put two cards back, please. Goodbye. So what? what is that? That's like a... That's like you get three cards, they lose two, and you kill their Jace, so that's like a six for one? <laughs> Pretty much. That's a you that's a you lose goodbye play. <laughs> get amazing. out of here. Alright, so we're gonna do like five seconds of dead space now. Last week on the coverage, many of you may have seen that the coverage was a little bit screwed up. You may have noticed some deck names that you did not see or had not seen before. So, Bob, what were some of the examples that you saw that you were unsure of? Some uh some of the things uh, that started blowing up on Reddit were very strange. So so there was uh there were two uh, bug delver lists in the top eight. One of them was called bug delver, and the other one was called Celtide delver. So they they just did not have their act together at all. But but really it was essentially the adoption of these new uh, wedge names from wizards that was causing a lot of consternation up on Reddit. Now I mean, for me, I'm not used to the new names. The new names came out what a week before this. Mm -hmm. We had just heard about these. I think for the majority of Legacy players, which are the majority of viewers of the Star City coverage, the naming system of the current cons block is very unintuitive. So, as a new Magic player, somebody just freshly into it, I feel like learning the, the color designations, for example, the one-letter representations, so like Wooberg, um, is a little bit more intuitive than even knowing what Jeskai is. That doesn't make sense. You would have to know the flavor of cons and learn what that is, whereas I learned Wooburg as soon as I started playing, like the first day I started playing, right? This this letter means this color. And so you can kind of understand that UWR, and based on their capitalization, means, you know, blue, white, splash red, miracles. Jeskai doesn't tell me anything about miracles, because Jeskai, in Cons of Tarkir, is a block, like, what, is that, what does that clan tell me besides the color? Just guy can be a mid-range deck, I'm sure, in standard. Maybe it's a control deck. Maybe it's an aggro deck. But does mm -hmm. that directly translate to the legacy version, right? Yeah, I agree. Not at all. Um, particularly for a deck like Miracles, too. It's, it, I mean, if you were going to give it a clan name or whatever, I feel like Azorius would be a lot more appropriate. That seems like the actual play style of the deck. Just because it incidentally has red for, like, red elemental blast, I don't think it's a very good reason to actually rename it. And I, I agree with you on a lot of these points. It's just that... It's kind of, I mean, it's definitely a marketing scheme from Wizards pushed onto Star City, and Star City pushed this onto their commentators. I really don't agree uh, with the new shard naming at all, just because it's so, um, it's so concentric. I mean, all mm -hmm. of the names are very um, Asiatic in their, in their naming scheme, and it's not very general. Like, I feel like, I feel like if they move towards this structure going forward, like, all of the shards are going to be named this forever. I think it's really awkward to try and carry on that flavor forever. So I think going to going back to, say, Bug or Rug makes it very easy because you can kind of choose what flavor of Rug you want. I would call it a Rug mid-range deck. It's a Rug threshold deck. It's a Rug control deck. Mm -hmm. Great. No problems. I can understand where the frustration was in uh, newer Lexi players saying, like, Team America. That doesn't mean anything. Um, right. You could argue that America should mean blue, white, red. Right, the flag, and mm -hmm. okay, that could be kind of intuitive, but on the scale of you know, if there was like a sliding scale of how intuitive a name is to what it actually translates to, you're still not really getting there. I think I think pushing the cons, uh, cons tribe is really not a good idea. Yeah, I agree for the most part. Uh, as I said earlier, it's definitely a marketing scheme, and it it just doesn't make logical sense, especially for things like bug or rug, which are just so so intuitive, so easy to pronounce. Uh, making them longer just doesn't make any sense to me. I can see an argument for, like, if there were really also a deck, you know, like Jeskai, for example, that was actually, like, blue, white, red, like, really low to the ground aggro, which is what Jeskai is, um, then perhaps I could see adopting that name because, you know, blue, white, red is a little bit wordy, but, you know, for a deck like Miracles, it's it's not in the Jeskai philosoph philosophy at all, so it makes no sense. I agree. So, I mean, how do we reasonably push back against this and kind of not, I mean, besides not adopting it on our own terms as a legacy community, how do we, how do we kind of reach out and kind of not agree with this? We can call Sean and tell him to go pick it outside of Wizards. I'm sure they would uh, notice that. I'm pretty sure they would because he'd be yelling obscenities at them. <clears throat> I think submitting deck lists as well, just, I mean, 
I've been continuing on in our, say, forum posts and, you know, as long as podcasts and coverage and deck lists, just do it the way that's most comfortable for the legacy community. I mean, the legacy community is very organic and it's changing and there's a lot of moving parts going on, but I think this is one of those parts that's trying to break into the cycle and I don't, I don't think it's going to and I think the community is pushing back against it. Agreed. Yeah, I mean, if I, I feel like if we don't adopt it ourselves, and if we complain to Star City, I know the commentators, uh, Matthias, I was talking to, I think he, he definitely got a lot of shit for trying to do this, so I'm not sure if in the future they're going to tone it back a bit. It'll be interesting. Uh, like, one example for this is, um, like on Channel Fireball, my latest article, they only uh, changed the name for Jeskai Delver, for, from Blue White Red to Jeskai Delver. Uh, Whereas they kept it Bug and Rug Delver, so I don't know if this is like the new policy, if they're only going to do Jeskai because it's shorter, or, or what if it was just like a random uh, change that has nothing to do with anything at all. But it'll be interesting to see going forward what they do. I mean, I'm looking forward to seeing how the community kind of reacts and how everybody else responds to it. I'm really hoping it just isn't shoved down our throats. I'm, I'm really hoping so. All right, so I feel like we covered quite a bit of, uh, maybe we should talk about maybe what cards become kind of nigh unplayable now. Uh, yeah, I haven't thought too much about this, but yeah, go ahead. So, we talked about what cards are going to be maybe see an increase in play to combat Treasure Crews. Mm -hmm. But I think the real question is what, what decks, or, I mean, we can think of decks first and then card choices, but what, uh, in the presence of Treasure Crews, what cards become really, really bad? Um, so I think... The first thing that comes to mind for me, at least, is Shardless Agent. Uh, Shardless Agent was always kind of clunky. The 2-2 was never super relevant, but when you had the upside of Kent skating into Ancestral Recall, I think it was worth it. Uh, now, I just don't think that's the case anymore, as you know, you can just cast Ancestral Recall without waiting four turns or without needing some setup or getting lucky. So I think the Shardless Bug deck uh, kind of dies and just becomes... Team America, or possibly there might be... You could still play a bug deck without Delvers and have it be more mid-rangey and have Treasure Cruise and still be good. So I, I think bug control kind of evolves. I agree. I think maybe Shardless... I think there will still be the holdouts playing Shardless Bug because I still think the deck won't be strictly terrible. I think it'll just see a sharp drop-off. Mm -hmm. And I think you'll see a lot more people... You you know, you cut the Shardless Agents, you maybe play True and MSI, you probably still play Toxic Deluge anyway, and you just play Dig Through Time. Yeah. Um, another card that I think we'll see less play is Snapcaster Mage. Yeah, Snapcaster is interesting. Um, you can actually delve with the card you're flashing back through Snapcaster. So theoretically, say you had if you had three mana available and like eight, uh, the Treasure Cruise and seven other cards in your graveyard, you could Snapcaster Ancestral. Sorry, so you can delve off of the. This sounds stupid, but I just haven't even thought about it at all. So you can delve off of it. You can. It, it, it requires a little bit more investment, and it's like if you draw your Snapcaster at awkward times when you've delved away your graveyard or there's like no instants or sorceries or something, it can be bad. So that's why I see there is an issue, but I, I did want to note that you can actually delve with Flashback. I, I'll be honest. I mean, now that I've actually read it and read Delve again just to make sure, I just totally didn't even... It wasn't even on my radar because I was like, well, I assume you're just going to be clearing on your graveyard. Why would you want to play Snapcaster? Yeah, just because you can get all the value with all the Ancestrals, play some Vintage. Why not, right? Yeah, I don't know. Um, I haven't tested this uh, at all, so it's it's kind of just spitballing, but I think it's hard to say. I don't think it would be completely unplayable, given that you can you can snap your Treasure Cruises, but it is certainly awkward at times. So what about that uh, that misdirection on that Treasure Cruise? Yeah, that that is awkward. In theory, um, cards like Force of Will and Misdirection should be really good with Treasure Cruise, just because you'll have so many extra cards, you, you'll be happy to pitch them for no mana. Uh, unfortunately, though, Misdirection doesn't redirect Treasure Cruise, so that's a little bit awkward. Oh, it doesn't say Dark Blade draws three cards. It's so, I feel so bad, but it is really early, so that's my excuse. Yeah, I mean, okay, so other cards that I think we'll see less play. I think Dark Confidant will see less play, because instead of having a creature that they can kill to stop you from drawing more cards, you can just draw more cards with Treasure Cruise. So I think Bob, sadly, will be going away. Or do you just run the vintage the vintage analogy of just like whatever fuck it, just put it in and draw more cards? Is that So so Dark Foot on the gas, really just... treasure cruise, take eight, and then ancestral myself. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> Unfortunately I think burn spells are played a lot more in legacy than in vintage, so I'd be a little wary of that. But I wanted to like have a car 
and cut the brakes and push on the gas and just go. Just go, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I will also note uh, that Treasure Cruise is sold out on Star City at 25 cents. Now, I'm not talking about the price, but I think a lot of people have just decided, let's pick up a place at a Treasure Cruises and see what happens. Yeah, uh, I think I think it's definitely going to see a lot more play. I just it, Once you cast it for the first time, you're like, wait, this is legal? This just feels wrong. Because um, uh, my playgroup, when we were testing it, we were like, is this going to be get, get emergency banned? Like, this just not feel right to be able to draw three cards for one mana. Um, so we were, we were like, entertaining the notion that they might pre-ban this card, because I know they've done that in the past for Vintage. Uh, but no, we're going to be playing this card for at least a few months. Which, you know, do I agree with it? Did this card need to be printed? Do you think? I mean, it's, it's, it's the same problem as before. Like, why is Blue getting all these stupid toys? I mean, I just, that part of it is kind of irksome to me. But honestly, I think they just don't test Legacy. Um, they might say that they do, but it's kind of hard to believe that they would uh, let this go past them. If they and if they're not, them. it seems like, why don't they? I mean, <clears throat> there's a player base here. And I think there was, don't get me wrong. I am excited that the Legacy format will be shaken up for the first time in about a year. I would say longer. I would say since Return to Ravnica. But yeah, go on. However we want to slice it. It's been a while. And uh, you know what? I, I enjoyed some success with Return to Ravnica, and I really enjoyed it. And I'm happy they did that. And I think that could have been pushed <clears throat> Excuse me, a little bit more onto non-blue decks. I think the printing of Delver followed by you know True and Nemesis followed by Treasure Cruise and Dig Through Time, I think wasn't necessary. I enjoy I the shakeup, agree. but yeah, I think it's a little bit. I think it's a little much. I think I think one or the other. I think I think it would have been okay with Treasure Cruise being printed with either a higher delve cost or a more invested uh, blue count, like say double blue delve. Yeah, I think that would make the card significantly worse. I think it would still see play, but it wouldn't just be like ancestral. I agree. What do you think of, uh, uh, so, uh yeah, actually we should talk a, bit, a little bit about the non-blue decks. So I think Painter is still playable for, for obvious reasons. Like, I think Painter can even main deck, like, they're splashing white a lot now, so I think they could main deck, like, one rest in peace, for example, and that also helps against decks with Emrakul. Um, and, you know, obviously they have the main deck Red Blast, so I think Painter is actually worth exploring. I also think, on that note, I think more Blood Moons is actually an excellent idea because a lot of these Treasure Cruise decks are all three-color Delver monstrosity as well. Mm -hmm. Blood Moons seems to be really good against that. Yeah, agreed. Um, yesterday, actually, uh, there's there's been a Goblin Stompy deck uh, running around on Magic Online. It's basically the old Dragon Stompy, so it has eight Moon Effects, some Trinospheres, four, four Chalices, um, you know, Chrome Mox, and the Salt Lands for Mana Acceleration. And it was actually fairly impressive. Um, just p because it played cards that, uh, killed their opponents really quickly, like Goblin Rabble Master. That guy is a house. If you have a Chalice on one, they don't have a way to kill him. Then he goes for one damage, then six damage, then eight damage, and they're dead. That's pretty true. Yeah. So Painter, like you said, I agree. I think is gonna definitely have some play, or that's the hell of a little change. Um, actually, you know what? I think let's just run through a list of decks. Like, let's look through the established decks, the non-blue decks, and just see what they could change. How does that sound? Like yeah, sure. I mean, I think I think the other obvious deck is Elves. Um, so what's your opinion on Elves? I don't know. <clears throat> so here's my initial thoughts, at least my kind of line of thinking. If a lot of people decide to go with Blue-Red, like you did, at least for the next couple of weeks, I think people are going to try and push back using Engineer Explosive Zealous Persecution to get rid of, you know, the X-Ones, you know, your, um, the young Pyromancers and such, right? Okay. And I think that elves may suffer for a couple of weeks just because people are going to be packing a little bit of extra minus one, minus one effects. Reasonably, um, if people decide that drawing cards is not good and they really want to stop people from drawing cards, Spirit of the Labyrinth might see an increase in play. Now, obviously, the only deck that plays it is Death and Taxes. So, how good is the Death and Taxes elves matchup? As far as I recall, elves just rolls the fuck over Death and Taxes. Yeah, it's pretty bad. So, will adding more Spirit of the Labyrinths really hurt Elves that much? I don't think so. It does turn off Glimpse, but, like, yeah, Death and Taxes doesn't have a great way of dealing with Natural Order. So, can I say, how, how do I think Elves is going to do? I think Elves will be fine. I don't know, I'm just trying to think, like, how does the Delver... Delver, the Delver matchup? Yeah, so, my opinion on this is, I think the Delver matchups get a little bit worse, because... How those matches play out, either the Elves player combos off and then, you know, 
plays, you know, plays a glimpse that gets forced, and then when they play the natural order, they're out of forces, and that resolves, and the elves player wins. So I think those games, the elves player will still win. But I think the games where the delver player has a lot of removal spells, um, they're able to refuel and then just kill them and lock them out of the game much quicker with treasure crews. So I think blue white red against elves. Um, I think blue white red was favored before, but maybe it was close. Um, I think it's now definitely significantly ahead. That sounds that sounds right. Your reasoning seems pretty fair. Another deck that kind of I think really falls off the map is now. This is gonna sound silly, but Pox. There's a few people in our metagame that play Pox, and I think the Pox deck is not bad. It's especially good against Delver decks. I mean, who doesn't love the value of Snow Pox? Yeah. However, now that a Delver deck can quite, quite literally hold land, play play your blue whatever your blue duel, and then just like draw three cards and hopefully hit more land and get back on track. I really think sinkhole pox strategies are now defunct. Completely agree. It's, I mean, I would say that you could, it was still semi-playable before. You could enter a Star City, you could probably get an even or positive record. If you were a good player, you understood how the deck worked, and no problem. Mm -hmm. I think now that that time is over, I'm sorry to say. Yeah, I'm sorry to say too. I mean, there was a, there's a good mono white deck, there's a, some good mono blue decks. Uh, mono black is getting the shaft yet again though. I guess there's no mono green decks either. But elves. Oh, elves, elves is close enough. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, it's it's kind of sad. I'm I'm not sure how they fix that. Well, I mean, I'm actually I know how they fix that, but they're not gonna print. They're not gonna push. They have not pushed black and red enough, non burn aspects of red enough, mm -hmm. and and I kind of that's kind of where we're left at. So reasonably, does Spirit of the Labyrinth matter? Two mana, three one. Yeah, you can't draw extra cards, but as a Delver deck, do you. You have removal for that card. Like, it's... I just don't see Spirit doing enough. It's hard to say. Um, I know when I was testing the Blue-Red Delver against Death and Taxes matchup, uh, I was quite favored. But there were times when they had out a Spirit of the Labyrinth, and I just had already used the removal spell on, like, Mother of Runes or Thalia um, in order to, you know, continue my game plan. So there were times where it was awkward when Spirit was out, and, I, and it's possible that if Death and Taxes starts running, like, four Spirit, as if this Cantrip Cartel really catches on then I think it is actually possible that Spirit will matter. Because right now, you know, they're only running one or two. But if they run the full set, chances are even if you kill one, one might stick around. And, like, Ponder's still pretty terrible under Spirit. Brainstorm's unplayable. Treasure Cruise is obviously unplayable, too. Um, so I think Spirit might make more of an impact because it's actually worth playing as a four of because it, it's so versatile now. Um, so I would I would be interested in testing that. Death and Taxes is not my style of deck, personally, but... I think it might have some potential, uh, yeah. Is it worth putting Spirit of the Labyrinth in another deck, or do you see it going into some sort of other shell other than Death and Taxes? Maybe Maverick or something? Yeah, the thing is then you would you would be playing basically a hate-bear strategy because you're not playing the powerful cards. It's kind of like Vintage. There's decks like that that exist um, that people play, I, I guess. I mean, other hate-bears also get better, like Gattaki gets better because they can't cast Treasure Cruise. Oh, that was that was another card that I was actually going to talk about right after. Bob, you're reading my mind again. I know, right? I mean, there's only so many cards in Legacy, so it's it's there's a there's a short list of actually playable hate bears, and Teague and Spirit are definitely on that list. I mean, I don't really want to talk about Spirit anymore. I think it actually, I would almost rather have Teague for the reasons that I will explain next. But I think Spirit is fine if you're already in Death and Taxes. If you're already in that deck, awesome, play that card. Maybe if you're on. Bant or something like that, and you're playing blue just for Edric and Judges Familiar or whatever, fine. But, Gaddictig. Let's let's talk about Gaddictig, and I've been on the Gaddictig train for years. Mm -hmm. Literal years. And, I don't know, I just think he's, I think he's much better now than he has been in the past. Because before you were basically playing him for combo, or control decks that ran Wrath of God. <clears throat> then Jason Mines Holder got printed, and you're like, okay, this stops them from playing Chase. But he still gets removed. Mm -hmm. Then they printed Terminus and Retreat the Angels, and you're like, wow, he's actually really good against them. They actually have to remove this guy, otherwise they can't be on their game plan. And now they print Treasure Cruise. So, I mean, where do you see... Is Gaddicti good enough to bring in a, good enough to bring in, in a Delver matchup? Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. I mean, as you said, you are the Gaddicti expert. I've ne actually never played with the card myself, so uh, I'd have to defer to you. My question would be, like... What kind of shell would you play him in? Like, Maverick would be the obvious choice, I suppose, but would you play, like, four green sun, one teague, or, or how would it work? Well, in my opinion, in my, or opinion and experience, 
I think the best way to do it is you need some tutor for him, at least one to two tutors. And then most people run between one and two teagues uh, in their 75. I think the better way to do it is to actually run two to three teagues for the reasons that I'm going to kind of outline now. Number one, you actually want to see more teagues. And you don't want to see virtual teagues. You want to see real teagues. The reason is they're going to have removal for him because he's that good. So if you get one removed and you have tutors but no teagues to go for, there's no point. Multiple right. teagues don't do enough. I agree. Like like the legend rule, obviously, that doesn't mean anything. But they're going to have to remove him if they want to cast a treasure cruise. So why not hold him or, I mean, depending on what you're running, you could brainstorm him back if you were, say, in a band shell or something like that. Or just not play him. Discard him to Liliana. Doesn't matter. He's also just a 2-2. Like, he also gets in there. So what does he actually stop in the um, in the Delver matchups? Well, he stops the treasure cruise. But what else does he stop? He stops Force of Will. That's pretty important. Um, a lot of the a lot of the Delver decks can't deal with, say, Knight of the Rel like big Knight of the Reliquaries or, you know, hard cast equipment. There's mm -hmm. a lot of stuff that is just a little bit too fair uh, that needs to get Force Will. And turning off Force Will is huge. Turning off uh, a Submerge as well is a big deal. I know the card is a little bit underplayed at the moment, but it is a free it is a free bounce. Yeah. Um, it's, I've played Gattateague against Rug Delver in the past just to hit Submerge and Force Will. So if there is a if there's a Delver strategy that is running Submerge, Force of Will, and Treasure Cruise, I will be on that bandwagon all the time. As well, we were talking about how Miracles is going to react to the metagame and how Miracles will still be good. It might even run Dig Through Time or Treasure Cruise, maybe instead of Ponders or in place of a couple of Ponders, whatever. So that just means your value on this card increases even more. <clears throat> if Omni decides to show back up, it's insane against Omni. Really, really insane. So they need to show and tell to go through it. But then what do they cast off of their... So say you, so say your opponent is playing show and tell, and they cast show and tell. Mm -hmm. You have Gattati, they have Omniscience. What happens? Then I guess if, you would you would need like Cunning Wish for an answer or something. Yeah, and that's just super awkward. So I mean, it basically means that they have to have the winning hand also with Cunning Wish in it. So that may, that gives that gives you it's kind of like reducing the number of doors you can go through to win. And Agreed. in a proactive strategy, maybe with Gattatig and Hand Disruption, shutting off say the Cunning Wish uh, option makes it really difficult for them to win. Um, now, if they've already entered the incident, then you know then you're boned anyway. But I think I think you're still like I said, reducing the number of options that they have, the number of windows that they have to win. You know, decreases as you lay down more and more Gattatigs or chains or you know, hand disruption, or what have you. Uh, well, like we were talking about with Tezzeret as well. I mean, that deck is basically just full of four mana bombs. Well, they're not getting cast. Uh, High Tide, if they decide to play Dig Through Time, hitting Time Spiral is something. Again, but they have Cutting Wishes. It's not doing anything against a lot of the other decks. So uh, all of the other non-blue decks, Gattic Teague is basically doing sweet dick all. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you have but, me convinced. Uh, put together a sweet like, list with Teague, and I'll probably try it out. Yeah, maybe I will. Maybe I will. Sorry, that was a long Gaddick Teague segment. I'm sorry, but I, I just love yeah, it. Yeah, I didn't realize you had so much love for the card. Holy crap. Yeah, no, you've gotten me excited. I, I just think he's criminally underplayed. He just needs to be protected. So however you decide to do that, whether it's Lightning Greaves... If you're a Stoneforge deck, maybe, or sort of Lightning Shadow, or perhaps Sylvan Safekeeper, which, uh, you know, is pretty good against removal decks. Or Mother of Runes. Or Mother of Runes. Yeah. So perhaps we will see a, a Death and Taxes list splashing green that is not Maverick. Yeah, funny. I think the last Ovino last year, there was the two finalists were both from, like, the same store in Moscow. One of them was playing Blue Red Delver uh, with Stifle Wasteland, and the other one was playing Death and Taxes splash green. It was playing. It was actually playing Death and Taxes and not Miracles because it wasn't playing Green. Uh, uh, sorry, not Miracles, Maverick, uh, because it was playing Ether Vials. Uh, yes, yes, yes. I remember that. Yeah. I'd also like to talk a little bit about Vintage. Yeah, that's fine. Um, it's looking like three or four decks are probably going to be the favorites for Vintage Champs. Um, I've been looking at a few. One is um, sort of the slower, grindier uh, shops. Uh, if you've been watching Vintage Super League, you've probably seen Chris Pecula playing it, um, Terra Nova Shops. So I've been playing some matches with that, and um, if you've watched his matches, um, you'd notice that the games in which he loses are the ones in which he kind of draws dead. Um, 
and the deck is really threat light. Um, so, you know, four or five turns go by, and he has his opponent essentially locked out. But the games where he's lost are the ones in which he hasn't been able to draw a threat. So we've been, we've been kind of testing with that initial shell, reducing a few of the man lands, um, and adding... Needs more Slash Panther. Well, I think that's the ab- absolute other end of the Vintage Shop's spectrum, which is... Oh, oh yeah, yeah. I mean, it does need more threats, though. I think that's, that's the central problem that we've been kind of running into. Um, you, you get kind of an early lock, and you, can't, you basically can't finish a deck that has basics. So um, we've tried a few... Yes, you can. Well, you know how? You know how? Uh, flip the table. Seven, seven yeah. ten, baby. Well, again, that that doesn't. You don't play. You know, you're you're not really playing that any non Forge Master versions, right? So this is this is a deck with null rods and all the spheres and all the man land. So, oh, okay. yeah, yeah. So this is a totally different take on it. Um, but anyway, the deck doesn't have a few of the things that that can really help you quickly close the game, like Forge Master being one of them. It also doesn't play Tangle Wire, so if your opponent starts to pull away, you don't have Tangle Wire to kind of reset the turn. Um, so, you know, some games it has blowout, some games it doesn't. Anyway, we, we've tried a few things, like um, uh, adding more main deck Crucibles so that your Waste Lock is stronger and your Man Lands are stronger. Um, the other card that we've been playing with, or I've been playing with a lot, is Coercive Portal. And um, we took the Null Rods out, or I took the Null Rods out, and put in Coercive Portals and more... In more crucibles, and what, what I f- about that, what about that port? What is it about like Ugin Portal or whatever it is? It's the one where it's like they can't take extra turns or something like that, and you get an extra turn if this thing goes to the graveyard or something like that. Yeah, you uh, you can only burn one turn out of it, um, but it essentially it's a really bad way to stop Vault Key. Um, there's a better way. It's called Phyrexian Revoker or Null Rod, but um, but yeah, I don't I don't know that that card's going to get played at all, especially. In any non Forge Master build, since it, I believe it's legendary, so it's really bad. Um, but anyway, Course of Portal is is essentially a personal howling mine, um, and that's that card's been working really well as far as pulling out of mid games and drawing into your threats, um, and then replacing the Null Rods and adding Karn. So Karn kind of gives you a an over the top way to win the game, maybe in one turn, <clears throat> and. Uh, Karn also doubles as artifact destruction, so he's been working really well. Is someone blow drying their hair in the background? No, that's you. <laughs> <laughs> Your quality is garbage, but my hair is definitely blown back by this format. So let's let me talk a little bit about my vintage experience in the last uh, three days. So I bought Black Border Power, um, I guess, over the last couple of months, and it's a really good feeling to play with real power. Now I don't have a full set yet, but I will eventually, and. They were just kind of sitting around, doing nothing, sitting on a shelf, and what was I going to do with them? So we decided that we're going to start a Vintage League, mostly a beer Vintage League, because that's, I feel, how Vintage should be played, with alcohol, European style, fun, and as non-proxy as possible. Now, the fun part about the first match that I played was I got to play a Sharpied Ancestral Recall, like literally like Sharpie on the back of a plane's Ancestral Recall, played off of a summer uh, island next to a black-bordered Beta Lotus. So the format is strictly cocaine. Um, I, I, can't, I can't really say this enough for those of you who are Legacy players who haven't tried Vintage. For the Legacy format currently, before Treasure Cruise, was stale. It is the same day-old bread that it's been for about a year, give or take. So I tried this format, and it is wonderful. Uh, there's so much interaction, and a lot of people are... A lot of people are arguing that, oh, Vintage is over in two turns and whatever. And I disagree. I think there's actually more play decisions in Vintage. Everybody has a lot of the same cards. But you're basically condensing the first, like, say, the first, say, six turns of Legacy are where all the, most of the action happens and where the game is decided. Whereas in Vintage, it's just in the first three. So we have all that action jam-packed into less turns. And it's really explosive. And I feel like what happens in a lot of Vintage games is... You have Force of Will, Force of Will, Mental Misstep, this, back and forth, Tutor, this, that. And usually what ends up happening is you end up just, either somebody clearly wins, or you both sit there and, like, draw go. But either way, you get to play with some amazingly powerful spells and some really, really cool strategies that if you have not tried them, I would suggest going out and, like, playing a few rounds with 
dredge if you feel for some reason you need to play dredge. I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't suggest doing that, but I would suggest looking at the the vintage Super League matches. I think besides yeah, Super League is seems pretty insane. If you if you aren't well versed in the format, you'll see everything. You'll see the you'll see the turn one blowout. Um, you'll see the dredge blowout, um, but you'll see some some back and forth blue matches. I would point to like Stephen Menendian and uh, Luis Scott Vargas's match as an example of what you're talking about, where you know it's blow, 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 counter blow, and then they're both kind of working off the top of their libraries, trying to get a little bit of incremental advantage. Um, you know that that match went whatever it was, you know, 30, 40 minutes, and had all kinds of back and forth and um, all kinds of decisions. And so there are some blowouts, but you know the same could be said for getting hoofed on the third turn. You know, I mean, it's it, it's a little bit more condensed, but um, to say that to say that it's like a turn one format is probably a little disingenuous. You haven't you haven't played a lot of vintage, um, if if that's your take on the whole format. So, I mean, I I sorry, I'll I'll just finish what I want to say, Bob, and then I'll pass it off to you, and you can talk for as long as you want. Um, the format is really fun, really interesting, really engaging. And I would suggest just to try it out, if you haven't, or watch some of, like I said, the Vintage Super League. Uh, I will just say one of the plays that I got to do the other night was literally tinker into Sundering Titan, blow up my Oath players, like, three of their lands, bounce it back to my hand with Jace, recast with Black Lotus. (laughs) And that was goodbye to my opponent. That sounds pretty awesome. So, until you have actually hardcast or whatever a Sundering Titan, I think you have really, truly not experienced a fundamental joy of magic, which is destroying people's lands. So, well, the flip side of that is being on the other side of the table, you are a very, very sad panda. That happened to me yesterday. Uh, I was playing Sneak and Fuck, and my opponent, Sundering Titans, me for both of the game wins that he got. Oops. Well, tell yeah, us hard about cast too, off of like five lands and an ancient uh, and a grim monolith, but yeah, it's a thing. So I think I think I want to focus a little bit, maybe more on vintage coming up. I mean, we do have a very experienced legacy and vintage crew, like both Kobe, Sam, and Sean all play vintage regularly. So I'm I'm excited going forward. Yeah, vintage is gonna be awesome. More people are playing it on Magic Online. It's more easily available. I'm definitely looking forward to champs. Uh, are you going, Matt? Mm, school. Oh, goodness. But I'm Sean's going to be there. Is anybody else coming? I don't think so. I don't believe from I this podcast, Sam, yeah. I think Sam is going to go to the Jersey GP. Um, okay. Yeah. And uh, do whatever you do in Edison, New Jersey. Cool. Yeah, so Sean, nothing. you were you were talking a little bit earlier about the top few archetypes that you thought. Uh, well, I guess still on Terra Nova. Do you, how do you think of that deck against the other mud decks? Uh, how do those matchups usually go? <laughs> I think in the mud mirrors, you're looking at a few things. The first is mana dominance, like... He who draws and sticks a shop usually has a, a huge advantage, um, and the same goes for Wastelands. In the shop mirror, there's a lot of bluffing, because you neither of you can really interact much on the stack, so even if you're playing a super explosive workshop version like Metalworker, you still have to be very cognizant of which land drops you choose to make. And since you're never really playing around any soft counters, you essentially you play this game of playing the worst land out first so that it gets Wastelanded first, um, and I think the key card in the matchup, and it's pretty much been like this for a number of years, is Crucible of Worlds. Um, you'll see it brought in in mirrors all the time. Uh, he who can stick a Crucible uh, can usually win the game because you, it really means you're winning the Mana War. Um, but, you know, I think in a vacuum, uh, the best shop deck against other shop decks is probably Metal Worker because it just, the, the, the hands you can get the explosiveness of your deck is is way way far on another level than than the um, let's say the let's say the Terra Nova deck. Um, in other words, you can play through a sphere, sim, you know, a very a number of spheres easily with a metal worker. Um, so I, I think in that world, probably the metal worker build is is the best. But I do think the metal worker build is very soft against the bug deck, which is sort of the predator of all the the shop decks. Is this is this bug deck that's come around the last couple of years? I think it's the weakest to the bug deck, so that's the flip side of that coin. <clears throat> okay, makes sense. What are the other uh, like big archetypes that you thought were going to make a big showing at champs? Yeah, I think at champs we're going to see we're going to see a lot of bug. Uh, well, let me preface this by saying this is sanctioned vintage, which makes a big difference. Um, when you're preparing for a sanctioned vintage tournament, 
Dredge isn't just a boogeyman. Like, it exists. It's the real thing. And you have to... I mean, you have to either... You have to either tell yourself that you're just going to hope to avoid it and uh, skirt on your sideboard spots, or you really have to plan to play against it. Um, in Unsanctioned Vintage, I think it's a little different. I think most people have almost a gentleman's agreement where nobody wants to play it, nobody wants to play against it. But when it's sanctioned, it's a different deal. And the same also goes for Merfolk. Last year at Vintage Champs, there was a ton of Merfolk, not just because it's a good deck, but because it requires a lower investment in power. There's a lot of overlap with Legacy cards. Um, so I would say Dredge and Merfolk only because of the fact that it's sanctioned vintage. Um, and I think the other decks you're going to look at are the Bug deck. Um, and those, those can vary greatly, but the core of the deck is just what you'd think it would be. Uh, a bunch of blue counter spells, abrupt, abrupt decays, death right shamans, uh, and dark confidant. And then, and then you're going to have all the variants of shops. And, um, you know, you're, you're always going to have blue control, um, Grixis Control is very popular. Um, you've got Gush Storm Combo. But I think the decks to beat are Shops, Bug, Merfolk, and probably Grixis Control. Yeah, I'm, I'm starting my testing for uh, for the champs uh, right now with Rich Shea, and we're trying to like brew a like Treasure Cruise deck, Faded Notion Thief deck. Uh, still, still a lot of work to be done, though. Yeah, Rich beat me last year. He was on a, another deck that I love, but I just haven't been able to beat the bug deck consistently with. He was he was playing uh, Wizards last year. And, um, oh, cool. Yeah, and it, it's a really cool deck, or his version of it was really cool. And he actually beat me because he had, I believe, four copies of the card Basic Island. And, uh, and he powered through what was pretty much a soft lock um, just by drawing out his lands with Dark Confidant. Um, but yeah, I, there's some space... To be, to be played with as far as like some of the Cavern Wizard decks or the Notion Thief decks. But, you know, they're, they're just not going to maybe be as consistent as um, some of the other strategies. But I, I tried Esper Wizards for, for about a month on and off. I was testing it. And it was pretty good against Shops. It was really good against like the, the Grixis Jace decks because all your guys have Flash. Um, you have access to like Avon Mind Sensor, um, Vendillion Click, cards that are just a beating in the control match in the Tinker match, um, but I just had a lot of trouble with the Bug fish decks. Um, they had Abrupt Decay, which is way better than my Swords to Plowshares, and they could snap it back, and it was kind of a tough matchup, but um, yeah, I mean, there's room for all kinds of decks, um, and Notion Thief, Ralzeric, or uh, sorry, Notion Thief deck is definitely a beating. Yeah, seems pretty hard to beat. Anyway, I think uh, we need to start wrapping up. Yeah, let's uh, let's shoot for like a full blown Eternal Weekend preview, and um, we'll get prepared, and maybe maybe a couple of you guys can tackle the Legacy side, and um, a couple of us can tackle the Vintage side, and we'll just kind of we'll kind of go through the top four or five dogs as we see it. Yeah, that would be sweet. I would really like to be back on for that. I think we could arrange that. So I just want to do like a little bit of an outro. <clears throat> so to our listeners, I just want to get some feedback on uh, doing commentary again. So, if you guys remember, for the for our first few episodes, we took Star City footage and we kind of talked over it and saw what people were doing wrong or, you know, basically going over the decision trees. And basically, we were wondering if you wanted us to do that again. Uh, a few viewers had asked us to, uh, but we weren't sure if we wanted to do it again. Uh, we were also curious to see if there was interest in us uh, streaming Magic Online and uh, talking over it. Uh, so, we would... Uh, have some sort of Magic Online account, we would all be playing while we record, or one of us would be playing, and we'd all be talking over the decisions and recording it and then posting it. So if that's something that would interest uh, the listeners, we'd you know, love to hear your feedback. It wouldn't even have to be Magic Online. I mean, if it's if it's you versus Jacob, we could do it in Cockatrice, and then me and Bob could just make fun of you guys while you play. I mean, you can, you know. You know. That's, true. that's true. I mean, but we're basically saying some sort of uh, online uh, way to do it. Now, as a viewer at SOE, actually asked a question about the gentleman who was disqualified from the top eight of the tournament you were at, Bob, for slow play in that Liliana split. Yes, I was there. Um, essentially what happened was Steven had been given a warning earlier in the day, and your second slow play warning is a game loss. Uh, and so the judge ruled that his Liliana split took over 90 seconds, I believe. And so then he, he double-checked with the head judge, and then the ruling was a game loss, and he was knocked out of the game. Uh, I think in that particular game, uh, it was kind of moot because I don't see him winning through, you know, 
uh, the Miracles player board of a bunch of angels. But on the other hand, uh, it, I thought it was slightly harsh, just given that the, um, the the setup of the board was very complicated and it was going to be very difficult for um, Stephen to win, regardless of how he split it. So he was really just trying to get the best uh, split possible. I agree. Like I actually timed it, and it was over 90 seconds. I agree. Um, I don't think it was relevant to give him the game loss of there. Now, depending on how long he actually stretched it out, I think at 90 seconds I would tell him, you need to make the split hurry up. Or even at a minute. Yeah. I mean, it, it, there's a problem with how the how the words of the... The actual letter of the law is a, is a little bit vague. Um, it, you know, and essentially it's telling you that you should be playing at the same pace whether there's two minutes left or there's the first two minutes of the match. But I just think the reality of Magic, as the board state, like Bob said, gets more and more complicated, the chance that you're going to be playing as quickly as you are in the first two turns, as you might in the fourth or fifth turn in a really complicated board state, just isn't possible. You know what I mean? Um, you're just you're going to have more creatures. You have more permanents. You may have more cards in hand. Your graveyards are all full. So it's kind of a tough thing to, to judge. At the same time, he has to know in the back of his head that he's already gotten a warning. So he has to be really cognizant of that, I think, um, when he's, you know, when he's in this situation. And it's it's also not illegal for him to ask the judge and 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 sort of clarify the fact. Hey, I got a warning earlier. This board state is very complex. This may take a little bit. I mean, he, he's not going to just get thrown out of the tournament for asking that question. So there's some things he could probably do a little differently too. I'm sure he'd tell you the same thing. Um, but the rule, the rules as they stand are just they're just tough to enforce and they're tough to uh, they're they're just really subjective in some cases. So it's it's tough. I agree. Um, I don't want to talk about this too much longer because I, I, now I really have to go. But I just want to say, Bob, thank you very much for coming on the show. Yeah, no, I was really happy to be here. Thank you. And Sean, thanks for being in a Dunkin' Donuts and not recording your end of the cast. So we'll just relay what you said. Yeah, no. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah, it's it's been recorded here, so you'll you'll have something out of my mouth besides bile. So, all right. But, uh, yeah, I'll catch up with you guys later. And real quick before we leave you, we want to shout out to an event that's coming up soon. The Mana Drain is hosting a Vintage Magic Online Open Saturday, October 19th at 10 a.m. Eastern. It's paying out 1,280 tickets and guaranteed prizes. Entry fee varies by when you register and starts at 20 tickets. There will be more information in the show notes. Feedback is always appreciated. Email us at everydayeternalcast at gmail.com. Like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash everydayeternalpodcast. Or follow us on Twitter at eternalmtg.